Southern California, some of the most in-demand urban real estate in the U.S., beautiful weather year-round, the Pacific Coast at your doorstep, progressive politics. It should be a paradise of walkability and car light living, but instead, the streets look like this, and apparently, they're still pumping oil out of the ground in the middle of a city. Yeah, I spent a few days in Long Beach, California, and I just have a whole bunch of questions. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewers suggested topics always welcome and literally no one recommended that I go to Long Beach but no one tells me what to do. Let's get you situated. Long Beach is a port city that borders LA, but where downtown LA is miles inland from the coastline, downtown Long Beach is 20 miles south, right on the Pacific. So it's an oceanfront city in one of the most expensive metro areas in the US. This means you're gonna have beaches, specifically long ones, and you're gonna have marinas and water-based activities. This is Rainbow Harbor, downtown basically, and yes, I did get a literal rainbow while I was here. Pretty active spot, lots of tourists and families, and it does feature outposts of the world's second, third, and fourth greatest restaurants. The thing about Long Beach, though, is that even though so much of the waterfront has the trappings of middle-brow Southern California tourism, you can never really fully embrace the illusion that you're in a subtropical paradise because when I say Long Beach is a port city, I mean it is the mother of all port cities. And by that, I mean the combined ports of Long Beach and LA, arranged around the San Pedro Bay and the mouth of the LA River, is the busiest container port in the Western Hemisphere and the conduit by which so much of our trade around the Pacific Rim happens. And I just love that as you spend time along the Long Beach waterfront, you get a constant juxtaposition of this sort of generic SoCal vibe that's kind of studiedly laid back but also way too intense at the same time, with just massive amounts of literally the most blue collar kind of activity you can imagine. Long Beach does embrace its identity as a port city though, if the artwork in my hotel room is any indication. So right off the bat, I'm gonna have a soft spot for any city that doesn't shy away from its blue collar roots, but let's be realistic. Every part of greater Los Angeles is outrageously expensive. I'm guessing there aren't too many longshoremen living in downtown Long Beach. Even though it feels like downtown is a spot where you could accommodate much, much more housing than they already do. And let's talk about that. Remember, extremely pleasant climate year round, pretty flat. There's a legacy downtown grid in place. It's really a nice ideal location to build the kind of density and walkability that Greater LA desperately needs. And there is some good stuff here. I think you could probably say Long Beach is moving in the right direction, investing in walkability, bike infrastructure, and density on some key corridors. And it's not just downtown. There are other cool neighborhoods with tons of walkable destinations. I mean, if you watch this channel, you know my whole MO. I visit the parts of the city I can walk to or access easily by transit, and I realize I'm a weirdo, but I personally found a lot of Long Beach very navigable without a car. And I assume if I had a bike with me, I'd be doing all right with that too. But like a lot of expensive coastal California areas, when you're walking around, you can't help feeling that nimbyism is in full effect. Maybe not to the same extent as San Luis Obispo when I was there a couple months ago, but there's just something about a certain type of California city where they just love putting up signs telling you all the things they don't want you to do. The thing you'll notice though is that while there have been spot improvements to the bike infrastructure, and there are streets with good old streetcar era urban fabric, far far too many of the streets look like this. You know, I hate to call Long Beach a suburb because it really is its own city with its own unique history separate from LA, but there's no getting away from the fact that people really rely on their cars here in the same way they do in most US suburbs. To underline the point, let's compare it to Jersey City, another large suburb, also really its own city, close into America's other mega metropolis. And the difference in car ownership between these two cities is just absolutely staggering. 75% of households in Jersey City get by with zero or one car, and that number is just 30% in Long Beach. By the way, the whole question of why America's two largest metro areas are so radically different from one another is a whole topic in itself. And this isn't just about numbers. 
the idea that people in LA are obsessed with driving to the point where it's all they ever talk about feels like a cliche from an SNL sketch, but in reality, pretty much any time I went out for coffee or food on this trip, I found that the people sitting at the table next to me spent at least part of the time talking about traffic, what route they had to drive to avoid whatever congestion there was, or how much time they spent trying to find a place to park and that's why they were late. I understand people's lives tend to revolve around their cars when they live in sprawling suburbs, but Long Beach is not a sprawling suburb. I did a video recently where I mentioned Ivan Illich's idea that so many Americans spend a full 25% of their waking hours either driving or working the hours they need to be able to afford to drive. Well, in SoCal, it often feels like you spend a whole other 25% of your life just talking about driving. And this is why, as much as I enjoy visiting SoCal, I I usually end up feeling like it just isn't a place I could ever live. Because as beautiful as the natural setting and the climate are, it's really the worst of both worlds. You're getting the expensive housing of New York with the car dependency of like Phoenix. I want it to be better and I feel like they are making strides, but here's the thing. Not only does it sometimes feel like the streets in Southern California are designed like racetracks, in Long Beach some of the primary streets downtown are literal racetracks. I'm here in the middle of March. The Long Long Beach Grand Prix isn't until the weekend of April 20th, but the city already has its streets lined with reinforced concrete barriers and prison grade hurricane fencing. Probably not the vibe you want to have along your beachfront promenade, but maybe that's just me. I know Long Beach isn't the only city in the US that does this, but man, the ADA accommodations are just wild and the whole thing just feels like kind of a perversion of what otherwise seems like a reasonably walkable, well-connected area. I know, I sound like a killjoy and I'm sure there are a lot of locals who are very attached to the Long Beach Grand Prix. Trust me, I know people are attached to local sporting events, even ones that defile the street network and disrupt land use. Like, I had a video where I suggested that that just possibly having an enormous oval racetrack that hosts one signature event every year, like two miles from downtown Indianapolis, might not be the best land use concept and the Indiana Politans, or whatever you call them, were just absolutely incensed. By the way, at time of taping, I'm just a couple thousand from filling this bad boy. Okay, I do want to talk a bit about transit here because something I found ironic was, as apparent as the car dependency is in the numbers and in people's everyday conversations in coffee shops and bars, the transit service in Long Beach seemed okay. First of all, water taxis are already cool, but the Long Beach Aqualink has a snack and beverage bar to help numb the pain while you endure an arduous 40 minute ride to Alamitos Bay on the eastern edge of the city's shoreline. Downtown Long Beach also has its own transit-only street on 1st, where you can catch Long Beach transit system buses and buses from all kinds of other providers around the region, which I can never figure out why you need like a hundred different transit providers, each with their own branding and fare systems and revenue models and route planning and administrative overhead. I don't know if it's a symptom of Southern California's car dependency or if it's a cause, but if you can manage to navigate all the information, you can usually find a service that gets you where you want to go fairly efficiently. The First Street Transit Mall also includes the southern terminus of LA Metro's A-Line, which I'm told is, at 48.5 miles, the longest light rail line on planet Earth, which I don't think is something you ever want to brag about. It's definitely a long ride, about two hours end to end, so a longer ride than, say, the train from Madrid to Valencia, which covers about 200 miles. No, I'm not bitter. At least the A-Line uses some of the old right-of-way from the Pacific Electric Red Car Line once you get past Willow Street a couple miles north of downtown. In a previous video, I talked about the long-term impact of electric railways on the walkability and urban form of Los Angeles, and all of that still lingers in Long Beach too, to a certain extent. And Long Beach celebrates this rich heritage with a mural on a utility box. Anyway, the A-Line is fine. Headways get as low as eight minutes at peak times. Cool if you don't mind an hour plus ride to downtown LA Union Station, but the city has managed to catalyze some development around the line. Let's get back to the idea of Long Beach as an active port. 
The city is organized around the mouth of the Los Angeles River, really only a river in the sense that it discharges liquids of unknown origin into the Pacific Ocean. But it is a great spot to dock container ships and apparently other kinds of ships. And when I do these city visits, the question I'm always trying to answer is, what does this city have that other cities just don't? Because there's always something, and in the case of Long Beach, one thing is the RMS Queen Mary, which was purchased by the city and permanently docked in Long Beach starting in 1967. It costs 40 bucks just to get on the thing. Is it worth it? Well, maybe if you're an extremely professional YouTuber and you can expense the admission fee. It's fine, but I gotta be real. I am just not a cruise guy and the area does have cruise vibes, so there's only so much I could take. Okay, let's talk about the real reason people want to live in a place like this. I'd hazard to say the average human enjoys being near the ocean in a warm, semi-arid Mediterranean climate. Not all humans. I'm sure some of you out there insist extreme weather is where it's at and freezing or drowning in humidity three to six months a year is preferable. But for the median human, Southern California weather is kind of ideal. And it seems ironic because so many people here are so dependent on their cars, but they also seem to genuinely like being outside. They do like to walk, and run, and bike, and roll. It's just that when people here do it, it usually seems to be for very purposeful exercise and not for just basic everyday transportation. It's almost as if it doesn't occur to them that you could just integrate all this biking and walking into the stuff you already do every day. But maybe it's just that because of the way Greater LA is laid out, people just don't live close enough to the places they need to go. It's a problem. People definitely like being near the ocean though. Yoga overlooking the Pacific is a thing, and I saw more people here walking around with yoga mats than I've ever seen anywhere. And people definitely like living in close proximity to the ocean, especially places where they can moor their yacht right in front of their house, or at least where they can see the ocean. And I imagine these are not some of the cheaper housing options in Long Beach, even though the ocean views are a bit compromised by what's going on offshore. Yeah, I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, so yeah, I am gonna get to the thing that really does make Long Beach different from everywhere else. And it's something I was vaguely aware of, but actually getting up close and personal with it was just a different beast altogether. First though, brief reminder to engage the various screen elements if you wanna promote this minority report on the city of Long Beach, California to the wider world, and why wouldn't you? And connect on the apps if you wanna know when I'm doing like events in other cities. I always let patrons know first, and these all seem to sell out pretty quickly for whatever reason. And that's not meant to be a brag, it's just I need someone to explain it to me. So one thing you might not know about the city of Long Beach is that a couple thousand feet beneath the city lies the Long Beach oil field, which was discovered in the 1920s and quickly put into productive use. Keep in mind, this region was much, much less populated 100 years ago probably the understatement of the year. The land itself wasn't considered a scarce resource. We didn't have anything like the environmental protection laws we have today, and we certainly didn't understand the impact of fossil fuels on climate change the way we do now. So it's 2024, the region has a massive housing shortage, and California is, of course, a super cool progressive state when it comes to environmental and climate policy. So surely they're leaving all of that oil in the ground now. Well, I went to the epicenter of the Long Beach oil field in the area around Signal Hill to verify that the region is indeed walking the talk when it comes to the approaching green energy transition. I mean, the state is a leader when it comes to electric vehicle adoption, so certainly that's going to cut our fossil fuel dependence. Well, I hate to burst your bubble, but California might just be falling a little short when it comes to climate action meeting climate rhetoric because the area is still just absolutely infested with these pump jacks. Now, to be fair, most of them are painted earth tones, so they blend rather nicely into the natural setting and aren't visually repulsive at all. Or maybe if you're more cynical, you could say, well, this part of Southern California isn't that attractive anyway. What's the difference what kind of land you see on the side of a strode when you're driving by? 
It's all unsightly. But I would just say, a struggle to imagine something that crystallizes our country's addiction to fossil fuels and car culture better than the fact that we use acres of some of the most valuable urban land in our country, land that cries out for more housing supply, to simply pump more oil. Now, I'm not an idiot. I do realize a lot of these sites almost certainly need massive remediation, but I cannot get over the fact that there are working pump jacks in the parking lots of fast food drive throughs I mean, the whole thing is almost just too on the nose. Keep in mind, Governor Newsom recently signed into law Senate Bill 1137, which severely limits new drilling in, establishes health protection zones around oil wells. But the law is on hold pending a referendum that hits the California ballot in November of this year. The city of Long Beach has over 2,500 operating wells and has shown no appetite for decreasing production, which adds around $20 million in revenue to the city coffers each year. I mean, it's just a testament to how backwards our incentives are that we're using what should be densely populated urban areas for environmentally catastrophic fossil fuel extraction because it apparently pencils out better for the city. And I realize a lot of the extraction happens offshore, which I guess makes it marginally less objectionable. I just wonder how much more property tax you could generate if a lot of these housing units had unobstructed ocean views instead of views of poorly camouflaged oil derricks. Oh yeah, I forgot. It's California. People pay peanuts for property tax, so maybe it doesn't matter. Look, I enjoy California every time I go there. Well, I enjoy just about everywhere I go, honestly. But I always leave feeling this kind of awful sense of foreboding, because the state is just gifted with all the natural qualities you'd want for a great city living. The pleasant climate year-round, the natural beauty, all the great old streetcar-era urban fabric. It's just so dispiriting that a place like this ended up having such a toxic addiction to cars, to the point where it even affects people's everyday conversations. It just shouldn't have ever happened, and I feel like a lot of people understand this, but we still keep doubling down on terrible decisions. I don't even have a glass half full bow to put on top of this one. The only thing I can think as I ascended out of Long Beach Airport is how disheartening it is that even California can't follow through on good climate legislation, and how much we're counting on younger generations to drive the political change we need. It's a lot to think about. Well, that and fantasizing there was a train I could take back to Albuquerque that departed more than once a day and didn't take 12 hours. Eh, one can dream. You have probably noticed that I travel to different cities a lot more than I did at the beginning of the channel. And I am someone who likes to travel as light as possible, so that's where today's sponsor, Bellroy, comes in. Bellroy began in 2010 designing wallets that are slim and efficient and prioritize access to the items you use the most. And since then, they've branched out to bags, accessories, phone cases, all kinds of useful everyday items that stay true to the company's original design philosophy. I've raved about their tech organizer previously, and I do use that on every trip. Like, I can't even remember how I packed all this stuff before I got it. More recently, I got a hold of one of their light day packs, which is great for when I'm out on location, exploring a city and shooting footage. It's easily big enough to carry everything I need when I'm going out for the whole day, but it's also super lightweight and breathable, which is important when you're out walking the elements all day long. Okay, so I'm a fan of these products, but maybe even more important to me is that Bellroy is a certified B Corporation. That means they meet high standards for sustainability and social good, including the fact that they've upcycled over 10 million plastic water bottles and hundreds of thousands of pounds of industrial nylon offcuts to make their goods, including the tech kit and the light day pack, which are made from recycled woven fabric. You know I don't promote many things on this channel, but with Bellroy, you get a well-designed, high-utility item that you can feel good about. And if you use my custom link down in the description, you can get 10% off anything on their site. So go find something you like, or maybe even even better, something someone you care about will like. And that's all I got. Thanks for joining today, and thanks as always to the patrons for your direct support, which lets me take the occasional week off from my release schedule and go do events in other cities. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode next week, and I'll see you then.